Thank you, everybody. So it turns out that this audience is composed, apparently, of students and university presidents. So I have a message for the students first, which is I'm here to recruit you. But the university presidents shouldn't worry, because I'm here to recruit you as well. And I'm here to recruit everybody in this audience to a cause, not to an institution, not to a particular university, but to a new way of thinking about what higher education should be all about. We just heard a presentation that talks about what the future of the dissemination of knowledge is going to look like. That future may be here today, may be here five years from now, it may be here ten years from now, but it is inevitable that the transfer of basic information, and by basic information I mean foundational, things that happen all the way up through the university, is going to be automated and personalized and delivered effectively for free. Meaning delivered without cost, not just to the person receiving that information, but to the government that may be supporting it, or to the institution that may be curating it. And so the question comes as to what should the role of the university be? And one of the more instructive ways of thinking about that is to think about what is the role of the best universities in our world. And so let's do an exercise and think about this together. Let's say that through the great work done by the scientists of the world, we're able to build a time machine. But because it's the first time we've built it, the time machine doesn't work that well. It just sends us back about 30 years. But what the time machine enables us to do is to collect 10,018 year olds 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But we know, because we come from today's world, that these 10,000 individuals will comprise every single future president, prime minister, Nobel Prize winning scientist, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, world renowned artist, Fortune 500 CEO, significant entrepreneur. And these 10,000 individuals were handed to you, that traveled back in time for your care and feeding for four years. And you can do with these 10,000 individuals anything you wanted, after which they would go on to run every institution in the world. Now, the question is, and I would like to just see a show of hands, who here would say, oh, I've got a great idea. I'm just going to send them to a university as it exists today, and then they'll be ready to run the world. Who thinks that's the right thing to do with these 10,000 individuals? Anybody? Wow, not a single hand. But that is effectively what we do. Now, why is this not the right answer? It's not the right answer, not because what we learn at universities isn't important. It is. It's important to understand your field in depth. It's important to understand the underlying principles that make discovery work. It's important to explore other areas at universities that allow you to do that, so that you can have some facility with those types of issues. But far more importantly, for those people who are going to be in charge, far more important for those people who will be working with them and advising them, those who will be implementing those plans, those who will be thinking about how to translate those ideals into practice and work day to day to make this a better world. Far more important for those individuals to understand some core capacities. Capacities like how to be able to think critically, how to be able to solve problems creatively, how to understand how things interact, both people interact, as well as how systems interact, countries, political systems, 
markets, and then how to communicate and work with one another to solve those problems, and finally, how to understand problems from different perspectives, have a common intellectual language that binds together people from different countries, cultures, and perspectives. Now, these all sound like good things. They sound like the things that most universities will tell you that they teach. The problem is that those elements that I listed aren't things. In fact, one could argue that many of these things, effective interactions, critical thinking, creative thinking, don't actually exist. And the reason is that these are not monolithic ideas. These are combinations of component parts. If you want to understand truly how to think critically, you have to understand when somebody makes a claim, how you evaluate that claim. Can you think of a counterexample? Can you think of situations in which that claim would not go into effect? When somebody presents a problem to you and offers a solution, you have to understand how to think creatively in a systemic way. Where did the solution come from? What was the sample size used in coming up with this idea? How do you apply statistics to this analysis? And then how do you think about data that is too difficult to analyze because it's not clean, it's messy, it's what you see in the real world? At Minerva, we took 115 different components, habits of mind, things that become automatic, and foundational concepts, ideas that you build from. And these 115 elements together comprise these four broad capacities. We take the first year at the university and teach our students exactly these things. No particular course of study, no focus and subject, no introductory lectures, but how to actually see the world through multiple lenses and how to layer one lens on top of another over time so that when you are encountering the world's big questions, the problems that we are going to have to solve together in the future, because these problems are far too big for us to be able to solve them on our own, how you'll be able to think through them and work with one another and develop novel solutions that don't currently exist. We then take those habits and concepts, those 115 elements, and we exercise them with our students for an additional three years as they pick their primary area of study, as they explore other areas. Our students get assessed in two different ways. Number one, how they master those areas that they are exploring. And mastery is not about remembering information that is readily available and will be taught automatically by software but actually how to look at problems that have not yet been answered in those fields. All of our classes are built on top of the knowledge base that currently exists, as opposed to forcing you to sit down and remember knowledge that may actually be modified in the future. But you also get assessed on how you apply these habits of mind and foundational concepts to everything that you explore. How do you bring about a habit of critical analyses of various kinds to everything that you interact with. We do that by bringing together the world's smartest individuals. Last year, we had 11,000 applicants, out of which we created a class of only 111 students. The best of the best, coming from 40 different countries, where we treat our admissions process the same if you're a student applying from Russia, from the United States, from China, or from Rwanda. And we bring those students together in this curriculum, in an environment where 100% of our classes are seminar-based, 19 students at most per class, where there are no lectures, and the students have to participate in every single class they attend, 
They have to be actively present. We bring them together to do all of that while at the same time experiencing the world as it is. So in our first year at Minerva, students come to San Francisco and they spend their first year learning this common intellectual language, language that will bind them together and will allow them to work 30, 40 years from now on the big problems as they run the major institutions of the world. And they get to live in one of the greatest cities in the world, experiencing innovation from its heart. They use the city as their campus. Rather than going to buildings for classrooms and our own cafeterias and gyms and sports fields, they do all of those things with the citizens of San Francisco. And then, these students, for the next three years, will live in six global capitals. You start in Berlin and then go to Buenos Aires. The next year, they go to Seoul and then Bangalore. Then they go to Istanbul and London. And in every location, they apply what they have learned to the real world. They see the world together with students from all over the world and explore what it means to apply what they have learned on a daily basis. Now, why is this a cause that you need to be recruited for? Well, you answered your own question. When not one of you thought that it is a good idea to train the people who will run this planet and the various institutions on it in the way that we currently train them today. For Minerva's ideas to be copied, to be disseminated, but most importantly, to be improved upon by other institutions. For other institutions to come up with something that is even better than what we do. We need your enthusiastic support. We need you, students of these institutions, the individuals that are running them, everybody in between, to say, we can do this too. We can rethink our institution. We can go back to first principles and think about what happens when one of you will be running this country in the future. What happens when you will run the major institutions of the world? And it will be time for you to make a decision, a difficult one one that will have impact on millions of people's lives. Will you think through the implications? Will you think about the second and third order effects of what you'll decide? Will you know who to call, in which industries, in which other countries, and collaborate with to help you come up with a better answer? Will you be able to think through a creative solution that other people wouldn't have thought of because you've gone through the process of looking at the data and thinking about it broadly. And most importantly, will you be able to communicate what you have come up with and convince other people that they too should be supportive of this for the sake of their country and others? That is the kind of cause we want to recruit you to. And we hope you're going to join us on this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, uh, let me be a devil's advocate for Please. a bit. Uh, uh, Exercise your critical thinking. <laughs> How do you know that your students are good? I mean, you've explained that you've had yeah. you know, uh, students of, yeah. from 11,000 down to yeah, 111. 11, 111. Yeah, yeah. But how do you know that they're good? Yeah. Well, we, we go through a, a, a very rigorous screening process. So we look at three elements when our students apply to Minerva. So we look at grades. We do look at your academic performance. You have to be a very good student. And that's pri primarily because we uh, have an extraordinarily high level of demand in our courses. Our formal courses are very, very difficult. For example, we do some concepts that are taught by most elite universities at a graduate level uh, in your okay. freshman year. 
And so we, we want to make sure you're a good student, first and foremost. Secondly, we have our own set of assessments. So we give、uh, students a series of tests, as well as interviews, to assess various aspects、mm-hmm. of their personality and their capacity that are tied to attributes. That are connected with success in the future, especially those that are、uh, present in effective、mm-hmm. leaders. And then, third, we look for verifiable, demonstrable evidence of creativity, leadership, and initiative, things like overcoming obstacles, to get us to understand the very nature of who it is that we,、uh, that we recruit. Now, it is true. That among the 98 plus percent of the students that do not make our cut, there are students that attend and, you know, and because they, they've not been able to get into Minerva, the best universities in the world. And it is also true that there are many students that we did not accept that, for, for many, many reasons, are,、uh, are going to be very successful and are very, very smart. But we are really looking for a particular kind of student. The Minerva experience, though, is universal in the value of having active learning, small seminars, habits of mind, et cetera. The concept of living in seven different cities、uh, over four years, the concept of this level of dedication that you need to work and this amount of stimulation that you get is not for everybody. And so we really do try to screen our students to be a very particular sliver for which we think the experience will work. Right, okay.、Uh, and the follow up question to that、um, if、uh, you've mentioned that、uh, other universities can adopt and, and, and use what you do at Minerva, and you said that、uh, enthusiastic support is needed, is there anything else can be done so that、um, the process is, is a bit more、um, speedy in, in,、yes. in getting to the end result? Well,、uh, they, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs>、um, and so, one of the most remarkable things is in, in San Francisco, especially in the startup ecosystem, there is a copy of everything. There are literally, and I'm not making this up, two Airbnbs for dogs、uh, that have been set up in San Francisco, meaning the, the first one wasn't enough and somebody copied it.、Um, Minerva was founded three and a half years ago. And to this day, and it is true, what we are doing is not easy. It is、uh, not every day that you create the world's greatest university, so that's not a, not a common thing. But to this day, there is no follower. To this day, nobody has said, you know what? Boy, these guys have attracted a tremendous amount of students, they've attracted incredible faculty, they've gotten a lot of financial support. They're doing something that will really change the world. It's hard, but wow, this is having a real impact. Maybe we should do that too. <laughs>、um, and it doesn't have to be a startup. It can be an existing university. It can be an institution that says, you know what? We're seeing the writing on the wall. We can't charge our students, or we can't even have them spend time at our university doing lectures that Stanford is giving away for free. Right? Let's do something different. And so the more that universities have that conversation, the more they experiment and do things based on the science of learning and、uh, based on, on the efficacy for their students, the better it'll be. Thank you, Ben. I, I, I am sure that the students and the university presidents in the room have、uh, heard your message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.